everybody. I'm Levi Litvai, and I'm talking to Ken Roberts today. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we have uh, picked his article, uh, Populism, Political Conflict, and Grassroots Organization in Latin America, which appeared in uh, Comparative Politics in uh, 2006. So it's kind of the basis of a conversation about populism in Latin America. So I can say hi. Hello. Good to be with you. So, okay. So let me, let me tell you why I like this article. So I come from the European tradition. I'm from Hungary. I come from the European tradition of uh, populism research. And, um, and you know, if, if, if somebody looks at populism from the European perspective, they see Le Pen, they see Berlusconi, they see uh, uh, mostly outsiders, except for Berlusconi and a couple people in Central and Eastern Europe. And um, and it's really funny. You can totally throw them off balance by throwing out that. Well, actually, what do you think of uh, what do you think of Chavez? He was a populist too. Uh, you can totally throw them off balance uh, about this. And this article really gives a wonderful overview of populism going back all the way to the 1930s. So, like a 75 years of populism in in Latin America and uh, also ask some, um, some interesting questions, I have to say. So let me, let me pass it back to you now. Uh, Why did you write this article? What, what was the idea behind it? What was the, yeah. what was, what's the background? And, you know, I, I think in part it's for trying to, to sort through the complexities of exactly what you were saying. And, and basically the idea that there are a lot of different kinds of populism. And I think we're accustomed to, to realizing uh, that you can get populisms of the left as well as populisms of the right. So Hugo Chavez, and often in the Latin American tradition, you get left-wing populisms, Chavez, Evo Morales in Bolivia, Rafael Correa in recent times in Ecuador. Uh, but you can also get other populisms in Latin America that are not on the left. If, if you think of Fukimori as not everybody would consider him to be a populist figure, but myself and others wrote about him as a populist figure. And he, he certainly was somebody uh, was, who was more conservative. Um, and, you know, or somebody like Perón, who was kind of literally all over the map. I mean, I mean per classic Perónism literally spanned the entire ideological spectrum from the revolutionary left to the fascist right all within Peronism. And Peron himself was a military attache for Argentina in, in Italy, was influenced by Mussolini. This is back in the 1930s. And so was influenced by, by Italian fascism. So uh, we're accustomed in Latin America, I think, to, to not necessarily thinking of populism as belonging to the left or the right. Whereas I think in the European tradition, as you were just talking about, there's been more of a tradition of populism being thought of as belonging to the right um, until more recent times with the rise of Podemos and Syriza and some of the other movements in, in Southern Europe. And so it gets, so the European story becomes a little more complicated, I think, over the last decade. Um, but in part, this article was written to try to understand the flexibility of populism for locating itself, but really the article is diving in to the organizational variation that you find within populism and trying to understand how populist leaders, uh, I, I argue in the paper that all populism is always mobilizing. It's always mobilizing popular support, uh, oftentimes bringing new people into the political arena. But I say there's a lot of variation in how and, and where they organize their followers. Some populists like very, you know, have, have very unorganized or atomized social bases with no organizational intermediaries. You have a direct relationship between the leader and the masses. And that's fairly common in Latin America. But others do build strong political parties. Uh, Aya de la Torre in Peru was a legendary party builder. Historically, uh, Perón was not a big party builder. He, he, didn't like really to have a strong institutionalized party, but he built very, very strong labor movement. Uh, so there's a lot of investment in the labor bases. And then cases like Mexico, where you had both a strong party and strong social organ, you know, corporatist bases as well. Um, so basically the piece is trying to help us understand the tremendous malleability and diversity that you see uh, 
uh, within movements and parties that we associate with with populism as a political phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So let's start with some terms that definitely does not emerge in the European context that you used in the paper. So mm -hmm. we had uh, classical populism versus neo-populism. So yeah. what's behind those terms? Yeah. Um, the idea of neo-populism, you know, Kurt Weyland really introduced this in some of his work in the 1990s, looking, looking um, at sort of a new wave of populist figures and Fujimori being a key figure, uh, you know, Kohler in, in Brazil, who yeah, Kurt was a Brazilian specialist. And so he had done some work on the rise of Kohler in, in Brazil as sort of a right wing uh, pro market uh, figure. And these were populist figures who emerged basically out of the crisis of the old party systems in the 1980s with the impact of the debt crisis. Uh, these are sort of new democratic regimes. So there was an underlying regime fragility. Um, but these are countries, Peru, Brazil, where party systems were severely affected by the crisis of, of the state-led model of capitalism in the 1980s and then the transition to neoliberalism in the late 80s, early 1990s. And you often got political figures emerging who ran against the establishment, against the old, the old political parties, but then implemented neoliberal economic reform. So they were staunchly conservative pro-market kinds of economic policies. Um, now, when, when and, and Kurt introduced the notion of neo-populism to say that this is, you know, neo meaning new, it's, you know, it's a sort of a new, it's a new kind of populism, but also a new era of populism. And I think that, if I recall, that's really how Kurt understood the term, um, essentially understanding what I call classical populism is, is coming earlier in the, in the middle of the 20th century with the initial rise of labor movements and mass politics. And so it's important to understand in Latin America, mass politics does not really get underway until the 1930s in most of Latin America, the 1930s or 40s during the Great Depression, when Latin America moved away from agro-export based models of development towards industrialization. So there's a process of inward oriented state-led industrialization that is underway and the development of labor unions and sort of the breakdown of the old elitist or what we call oligarchic political regimes. And Latin America then moves towards mass politics by the middle of the 20th century and that's the context in which classical populism emerged. So it's the rise of mass politics, the mobilization of labor unions, and then the creation of the first mass-based political parties. Because previously in Latin America, political parties were mostly sort of elite-led clientelist machines. But you began to see the emergence of mass-based political parties. They weren't, in the European sense, labor-based social democratic parties. They were broader, more multi-class, but they had labor unions as a core base of support. Um, and so that's the context for classical populism. So the, the so-called neo-populism, you know, half a century later in the 1990s was a new wave of populist figures who did not support state-led capitalism, um, they tended not to be close to organized labor, but they often appealed to the informal sector of the working class um, and had rather broad multi-class bases, but much more free market oriented. But they were very staunchly anti-establishment. So they rose up against the old political order uh, and the traditional political parties. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the goal of the, the article uh, is to look at the different organizational forms. I mean, when we when we uh, think of the Latin American literature, it, it, on on a superficial level, at least, it seems like the the organizational form is 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 key and very homo homo homogeneous for for populists. But what you what you say here is that it, it, that's definitely not the case, and it might be a very just a superficial misunderstanding uh, anyway to to make it make such a claim. Now, you say that there are traditional explanations of organizational forms like structural and political institutional, and you contribute 
new explanations as well. So uh, can we talk about that a little bit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm making an argument in, in the paper that whether or not populists really make an effort to not just to mobilize electoral support, but to actually organize their constituencies, that it depends a lot on whether or not they are entering into conflict with, with established elites in their, in their countries. Um, mm -hmm. And so in other words, I argue you, you, you can find populist figures, both in classical populism and neo-populism, who really are, you know, they, they may have inflammatory rhetoric, charismatic figures, but, um, but they, they, don't, they don't really pose much of a threat to the old world. Uh, so Velasco Ibarra, historically in Ecuador, who was elected president five different times and overthrown four different times in, in military coups. Or, you know, he, he could get himself elected, but he couldn't govern is the bottom line. And part of that is he didn't organize. You know, he didn't really, he didn't have much in the way of a party. He didn't really organize the workers and, and the mass unions. Um, and he was a pretty middle of the road kind of figure. He spoke anti-oligarchic line, but in reality, he posed no threats to the business community. And you know he was there. You know his 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 famous statement was, "Give me a balcony, and I'll get myself elected president." And that's basically how it worked. You put him on a balcony, let him speak to the crowds, and he could get elected. But he didn't organize anything, and he didn't really come into conflict with elite interests that in ways that would induce him to to reach down into organized bases, um, where you got the stronger organizational push was in populisms that really did pose a threat to business interests, to the military in some cases, to other, it's what we often call in Latin America, and it's a term that doesn't really translate well, they call it poderes facticos in Spanish, uh, basically de facto power structures, the media, the business, financial elites, military forces, not necessarily established parties, but rather these de facto power structures. And I argue that populist figures are much more likely to really organize their bases where they are in conflict with those power structures. So Hugo Chavez was in conflict with this, uh, not so much the military, but certainly with the business community, the media, and you see Chavez reaching down and, and, and building organizations. So I argue then that there's that the more radical kinds of populist figures who really do pose significant challenges to business elites, they are more likely to actually organize their constituencies than a figure like Fujimori, who Fujimori organized nothing. I mean, he, Fujimori <laughs> or had four different political parties that were literally nothing, nothing more than labels for his, you know, for every election cycle, he created a new party or essentially a new way, but he didn't really organize much of anything. And he didn't need to, yeah. the business community, the business community, when they realized that he was, even though he had run against neoliberalism when he first ran for office, as soon as he came into office, he implemented the neoliberal model and the business community said, hey, this isn't so bad, we can live with this guy. And so there was, there was no reason for Fujimori to organize workers and you know, in you know, the peasantry against the business community. He, he wasn't doing anything against the business community. There was no organization yeah. at all. So is it really that simple then that if you embrace neoliberalism, uh, you will not need to organize? And if you pose a challenge to the establishment and the, 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 uh, the current power structures, then uh, you will need to organize to uh, to be successful is it is it really that simple the argument that you're making or i think i uh, i mean these are complicated stories and there's always going to be more yeah. going on but i think it i think as a starting point for understand where where do you get populisms that simply appeal to the electorate that you rely upon the media to help you reach out and appeal but you don't really need to organize any sort of intermediaries between you and the masses, you're more likely to get that with, you know, personality-based populisms that don't really come into conflict with established elites. Um, and I think I think basically organization is it's a political resource, it's leverage. 
Yeah. And you, you and you or in this day and age in particular, I mean, most poli you know politicians are myopic. They they have you know in democratic context, you're looking to the next election. You're trying to figure how do I get elected, and it's we're no longer in a in a time period where electoral mobilization is a labor intensive affair where you have to seek deep roots in society and have civic networks that turn out the vote for you all right and the age you know uh, sir, even with the with television and of course we're now way beyond television the age of yeah. the social media there are other ways of reaching out to voters and getting people to vote for you without having to organize and this is part of why i think the the era of party building uh you know you can identify a few places where where you see leaders building strong party organizations but it's you know uh, urban and hungry perhaps being being one of them um, but in general there there has been an erosion of political parties as mass organizations in most of the world um, and you're seeing fewer and fewer political entrepreneurs believing that they really need to invest in a long-term party building project when there are other ways of communicating um, and getting people to, to vote for you. Mm -hmm. so, so, the, so what I'm saying is I think that the kind of organization building that we saw historically tended to be a way of mobilizing political resources for conflict beyond the electoral arena itself. And that if the if if your conflict is limited to the electoral arena, you don't necessarily need to organize. Uh, but where you have conflict over radical redistributive economic reforms or big political rivalries, you need you know uh, Cardenas in Mexico needed to mobilize the workers and peasants um, as a base of support for him as part of the internal conflicts within the ruling party after Mexico's revolution. And so the mobilization is the corporatist linkages to labor and peasants emerged as part of his way of mobilizing resources he would need to wage this intra elite conflict within the so called revolutionary family in Mexico. Mm. The organization is, a, is it's a it's a political resource uh, that requires a long term perspective, right? You know, you yeah. invest and, and it's 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 costly and it's hard to invest in that kind of political organization. That's why politicians who only need to worry about the next election cycle tend not to invest in those kinds of party building projects. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you, you were already quite clear about this, but there are two case studies in this article, which uh, are very nice and in-depth. And if you, like, you're, you're like me and you don't know Latin America, they're very, you know, rich and full of context. But uh, so, I mean, we couldn't sum that up here in a short conversation. Um, and and Fujimori, you you say is is uh, is is the person who did not invest in organization. On the other hand, Hugo Chavez did invest in organization. Uh, what what would other cases be in uh, in this typology? Like who? Are, like if you think of the populists of Latin America, where where would you place them? Yeah, well, the the other case that I mentioned in the paper, uh, along with Fujimori, as being purely an electoral version of, of populism uh, would be Velasco Ibarra in Ecuador, who was an earlier figure, the one I mentioned a, a couple of minutes ago, who was elected five different different times. Um, yeah. And that would be another classic case of, you know, a populist figure who, you know, like, like I said, he could stand on the balcony and appeal to the crowds and he, and he, he had, you know, as as Kurt Whalen talks about it, a direct, unmediated relationship to the masses. You know, no political party as an intermediary organization, no labor unions. You know, he didn't want or need any sort of intermediary institutions. Um, and so I think that would be uh, another good case, you know, from an earlier era uh, of, of populism. But in Whalen's work, uh, you know, uh, Kohler in, in Brazil, you know, as a populist type figure, and of course he gets impeached, he comes into office and he's impeached two or three years later 
uh, but his political party had one and a half percent of the vote for Congress or something. You know, I mean, the political party was nothing. I mean, there's no organizational base. It's just just a personality. Um, but again, he was also part of the elites. He implemented neoliberal economic reforms. There was nothing that he really needed to organize followers against. That's very different from an Hugo Chavez. Uh, and certainly Chavez was a very personalistic, obviously a charismatic kind of leadership. Um, and his political part, you know, he did not have a well-organized political party, although it, it was develop it developed over time before he died prematurely. But there was a lot of grassroots organizing, um, community-based councils with the Bolivarian circles, sort of, it kept reinventing itself and renaming itself. But there's a lot of grassroots organizing that is going on as part of the social missions and the constant electoral mobilization that was underway in Venezuela. The other case, the case that probably had the strong, well, a couple other cases in Latin America, historically, Aya de la Torre in Peru, who doesn't get as much attention as, as some of the, as, as Perón, for example, or Vargas or Cardenas, who all became president, sort of the classic populist figures in the middle of the 20th century. but. Probably the greatest of them was Aya de la Torre, um, who never became president because the military blocked it. But he basically dominated Peruvian politics for half a century. Um, and Peru, uh, Aya de la Torre was a legendary organization builder. I mean, he built uh, Peronism, or excuse me, uh, Opera was his political party. It's really the first mass party, I would argue, in Latin America. Very well organized, disciplined political party. Um, and so we often have this assumption that populism is all about charismatic leaders and that they don't have anything organized. And, and that's certainly true in a lot of them, but you do get these outliers. And certainly Aya de la Torre was involved, uh, the military completely rejected opera for complicated reasons I won't go into. The economic elites also couldn't stand opera. So there was a certain logic of of Aya de la Torre building opera as this organizational force that would allow him to challenge these power structures within elite society. And it, it did not bring him to the president. He died when he was on the cusp of probably becoming the president as when he was much, much older in 1979. Um, but he was a very, very much an organ, he was the, the most, most organization builder uh, of all the populist figures in Latin America. The other case to keep in mind, of course, is, is uh, Evo Morales in Bolivia. And, I was just going to ask. Yeah, and that's a case where you had the leader, and, and he was in, you know, a charismatic kind of political figure who represented the different strands that were there in Bolivia. But the bottom-up mobilization was very, very powerful in Bolivia, and I would argue really created the the populist leadership grew out of the movement itself. Um, and the political party was founded by the coca basically a, a, a campesino or a peasant federation of the coca leaf producers in Bolivia. So that was, and Evo Morales was the leader of the union. Uh, but his leadership came out of this grassroots peasant federation, peasant union, uh, in the coca producing region. And then they founded a political party which became de facto the representative of other urban and, and, and indigenous movements within Bolivia. But there was a very powerful bottom-up social mobilization. It's really a movement-based populism that then created a, a type of, of charismatic leadership coming out. And then a lot of, and then there's tension between the movement dimension and the party dimension and the leadership dimensions. So there were tensions in all three of those, you know, sort of the, the three-sided relationship that, is, that existed. But that's the case where the, the level of bottom-up mobilization was by far the strongest of all that we've seen in Latin America. So I'm, I'm doing the math here. It, it's been over 15 years since you wrote this, clearly, because it was published uh, yeah. 14, 15 years ago. How, how do you see this piece 
from the distance of 15 years or 15 plus years? How, how, has it aged the way you would want all your work to age? You know, it's funny, I, I confess I had to, to dig up the article last night before <laughs> we were talking today. I go, go back and take a look at it because I, I couldn't remember some of the things that you know, I, I remembered sort of the main themes of the piece, but yeah. Um, but in rereading it, I said, yeah, I said that. You know, there was nothing in there that that made me cringe and say, "Ooh, that that didn't age well." <laughs> that, you know, that didn't turn out uh, quite the way I expected. Um, I th I think the contribution of the piece is not just to help us understand these different populisms of the left and the right, which is really not not the central theme, but to really help us understand the tremendous variation that exists in the kinds of social bases and the, the you know that that all of these populist leaders they're all you know they're all competing in democratic arenas and having to mobilize voters but then the kinds of relationships they have to those voters are quite different whether it's a direct relationship between a charismatic figure and the voters or whether it's mediated by a party or by labor unions or by campesino federations in Bolivia by these other kinds of actors. Um, and and I, part of what that's saying then is that these organizational dimensions are probably not definitional. You know, that they're, you know, that these are, you know, that they come on a lower level of, you know, on the on the ladder of abstraction, that they they help us understand variation between different populisms, but you know, none of them are part of the definition of populism itself. That populism is sort of at a higher level. You know, populism is, is you know, essentially drawing some sort of binary divide between the people and some sort of power elite. But then the what this article is getting at is how are the people organized, right? The, if if yeah. any, any populism has to mobilize the people. Um, but sometimes the people is an atomized mass, and sometimes the people has a strong party organization, and sometimes the people belong to mass labor unions or some other kinds of social organization. So that's essentially what I'm trying to do in this piece is try to understand the variation in the ways that populist figures organize the people. And, and I think in that sense that the piece makes a contribution that is, you know, I, I think it's still, I, I'm surprised sometimes, you know, I occasionally hear from people that tell me that they have used this article and, and that it helps them, I think, to, you know, to, to sort through those issues. And I think it's, you know, in, in Europe, generally populism is associated with a political party. And that's different yes. from Latin America. In Latin America, usually the starting point for thinking about populism is a personality. It's a person. Yeah. Perone, it's Evita, it's Cardenas, it's, you know, um, you know, and we still refer to Peronism as Peronism. It's associated with the name of the figure who's been dead for half a century now. And still, <laughs> yeah. you know, Perón still dominates Argentine politics. He's been dead for 50 years. Um, and um, so ultimately, uh, you know, that's, that's what this piece is trying to do. It's just, just to help us understand how do these populist figures organize or do they organize the people as they mobilize the people. So let me, let me throw you a curveball because when you wrote this, uh, Latin American populism was, was entirely leftist. And, and all we're talking about is, is, is on the left side of, of the ideological spectrum. But but uh, right now we have Bolsonaro, <laughs> who, yeah. who is not not so much uh, uh, a leftist populist, and and uh, most certainly has been called a populist. Uh, where would he fit? Yeah. Uh, well, he certainly he. I mean, I think Bolsonaro, much like Trump, is um, a very similar kind of populist figure to what you see in, in much of Europe, um, a type of right-wing populism that is right-wing not necessarily in, because of kind of a free market orthodoxy, although Bolsonaro brought in neoliberal technocrats to run the economy. Bolsonaro himself actually does not, he 
you know, his, he began his political career as sort of a right-wing nationalist statist. So he did not actually begin as, a, as an advocate for free trade and free markets, but he sort of made his peace with that. So, but basically what these guys are right wing, uh, it's much more the cultural platform of a nationalist right uh, that appeals basically to a religious nationalism, a very conservative set of religious values um, and identities in a context of pushing back against feminism, against gay rights, against indigenous rights and any sort of notion of environmental protection that often gets connected to indigeneity in the Amazon region, but pushing back against all of that. Uh, but then in particular, a very strong law, law and order kind of populism, cracking down on insecurity and criminal violence in society and basically constructing, trying to constructing the, the people in a way uh, that appeals to what are considered to be the an authentic Brazil, you know, Brazilian national community um, that is Christian, that is traditionalist in the moral sense, um, and Brazilians who um, are trying to defend themselves in a context of, of violence and insecurity. So in some ways it's exclusionary towards an underclass in Brazilian society that is being that is being framed as being criminal, the criminal sector. Mm -hmm. Needless to say, there are there is a racial dimension to that in Brazil, and so it's a kind of populism that tends to appeal to middle and upper class Euro descendant Brazilians, while being highly exclusionary towards darker skinned, uh, lower income sectors of Brazilian society that are being framed in the populist discourse as being disrupt disruptive or even criminal elements and not being part of the, the true Brazil. And so it's a, it's a certain kind of populism. It's, it, the immigration theme is less central in a place like Brazil than what you have in the United States or Europe. Uh, but it's also, it's a kind of ethno-nationalist and religious uh, cultural appeal to a certain sort of cultural identity and a national identity that tends to be highly exclusionary towards racial and ethnic minority groups, towards darker skinned sectors of society, um, and is very much wrapped in the symbols of the military and law and order and what we call the, the mano dura, yeah, mano mm -hmm. dura of Latin America, the, the iron fist against the criminal elements within society. There's a version mm -hmm. of it in the Philippines, Duterte, I think, and there's a there's yeah. similarity to this that you see. So there are versions of this. Um, there's the potential, I mean, Brazil's the place in Latin America where we really see this, uh, but there are a lot of places in Latin America that have severe problems with drug trafficking and crime and violence and we are all keeping an eye on this phenomenon to see whether it spreads beyond Brazil. There's a little bit of it in, in Chile. There's a far right nationalist figure who has emerged in Chile um, and we're keeping an eye on it. Uh, it's a very different kind of populism than the left. The left wing populism in Latin America is if you, if you put politics in two-dimensional space, you have a left-right economic axis and you have a vertical cultural axis where one pole on the cultural axis is more multicultural and cosmopolitan. The lower pole is some sort of racial, ethnic, or national particularism, okay? Mm -hmm. So these poles are now being politicized in Latin America as they have been in Europe. The, the left populism is appealing on the basis of severe social and economic inequalities and basically appealing on grounds of social inclusion, redistributive social policies. The right populism is making much more of a cultural kind of appeal to a certain understanding of the national community um, and its racial and, and national and religious identities. And the, um, from the perspective of uh, organizations, organizationally, would these emerging right-wing populists are more similar to uh, 
to Fujimori or or Chavez or, or where, where would they fall on this or or shouldn't we or we shouldn't even mix them in into no. this analysis bolsonaro you know he came out of a very small fringe evangelical Christian political party uh, but there's no end I think he's if I recall he's left that party and there's no I mean he, it's a personality based phenomenon, very strong support from sectors of the business community. So rather, you know, again, like Fukimori, so rather than clashing with business like a Chavez, who then had to build bases, you know, organized bases, uh, Bolsonaro does not do that. He draws support from evangelical and, and conservative Christian networks. Uh, he draws support from the business community. He draws support from the media establishment. Uh, but he does not have to organize at the grassroots and have, for the most part, has not organized at the grassroots. Um, where I would be concerned about organizing at the grassroots with this kind of populism would be essentially armed networks, paramilitary type networks, where there's been a privatization of security um, and a lot of arms, and Bolsonaro is a strong defender of private gun rights. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, there's a version of that story you can tell in the United States, as we've seen in, yes. in recent weeks. Um, that is, that's the kind of organization at the grassroots that is very different from what I talk about in the article. Uh, but that is a kind of organization at the grassroots that I would argue is exceedingly uh, dangerous for democracy. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. All right, so last question. So throughout the article, what I was wondering if there's such a heterogeneity of, of um, organization and personalization of politics, what does this mean for Kurt Whelan's approach to defining politics? I mean, you, you speak of the the people elite dichotomy here which which resonates more with how i i personally understand uh populism kurt Whelan has a has a different definition so what what does this mean for kurt Whelan's definition of populism this heterogeneity of of style and organization yeah i mean i think i mean Whelan emphasizes the the role of the leadership dimension and kind of the direct unmediated appeal to to the bases and i i think wayland would include for example i mean certainly he would include chavez he would include fukimori uh he would include rafael correa i believe he would also include Evo morales even though you know recognizing i mean first a very smart guy he obviously recognizes that you've got a lot of social mobilization at the grassroots, but I think he would still argue that, I don't want to put words in, in Whelan's mouth, but I think he would argue that, that Evo Morales is a charismatic figure who sort of pulls these different strands together and that you don't get the populist movement really without, without Evo Morales being there. Um, and he would certainly argue that Peron, you know, Cardenas, uh, you know, uh, Velasco Ibarra, in Ecuador, uh, Fukimori would all fit his model quite well. Uh, I'm not, sh you know, I haven't, I, I haven't talked to Kurt ab uh, about, um, you know, about uh, in in uh, in Peru with Ayade La Torre, who I think is a little bit more of a challenge because Ayade La Torre really was an organization builder. But I think Kurt would still say that. He was also a legendarily charismatic figure. I mean, Valle de la Torre yes. was a brilliant orator and a very charismatic figure. And I think Kurt would still say, yeah, you know, but without the, you've got the charismatic leadership that then ended up building. So it's not, it's not, a, it's not an unmediated relationship to the bases, but you still have that charismatic authority that is central to the phenomenon. Um, so I think Wayland would make a, a strong argument that his argument still still carries you a, a long way for understanding these different figures in Latin America. But I think, I think he would concede that not all po charismatic populist authority has an unmediated relationship to the, bases, to the bases. I mean, you do get these organizational intermediaries much stronger in some places than other places. Uh, but for him, 
the nature of that charismatic authority. Um, he he understands. Yeah, I mean, sort of. Let me just say, part of what what made Wayland's work very powerful in the mid '90s, and, and as long as some other stuff that I wrote, we were pushing back against an understanding of populism that associated populism with state-led capitalist development in Latin America. And so Wayland and I were both pushing away from this, this association of populism with a certain stage of development and a certain model of economic policymaking. We were both arguing that populism belongs is a political phenomenon. And in fact, I've seen yes. Kurt say, it, populism belongs to the sphere of domination, not the sphere of distribution. So it's not the economic policies. It can be neoliberal or it can be state-led capitalism. It's the political dimensions of, of populism that we have to focus on. So Kurt and I together were making that argument and our early work was controversial among Latin Americans because of that, because of this other understanding. So we saw these things in very similar terms. Over time, I probably moved in a more Laclauian direction, you could probably say in my thinking about populism, but uh, but Kurt has uh, a strong association on these political dimensions of populism and the, the nature of leadership and the relationship between the leader and the popular base. Yeah. Well, great. I, uh, I think that sums it up. Any Anything to add? <laughs> Uh, I think we covered a lot of ground. I, <laughs> you've given me a chance to go back and, and dig up an article of mine that I hadn't looked at in a while and to try to think about where, sort of where did this fit within the debates that we were having about populism at the time and, and continue to have about populism. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for talking to us about this. Okay. Enjoyed it. Thanks for the opportunity. Take care. Everybody. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.